Welcome to First Do No Harm with Massachusetts Citizens for Life board member and physician, Dr. Mark Rollo. This broadcast will focus on medical ethics from a Catholic perspective and address abortion, physician-assisted suicide, contraception, natural family planning, IVF, healthcare proxy, and other topics. Please be advised that this show may not be appropriate for children under 13. Hello and welcome back to First Do No Harm, a show about medical ethics from a Catholic perspective. I'm Dr. Mark Rollo. Last time in part two of my interview with Massachusetts Family Institute President Andrew Beckwith, we discussed the blessing of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. However, we also discuss the fact that just as millions of innocent human beings will be saved from the atrocity of abortion, millions more will still be considered legally disposable and an impediment to so-called reproductive rights. That is because while many pro-life states will ban or severely limit the barbarity of abortion, It will continue unabated in states like California, New York, and right here in Massachusetts. They will continue to use the paradoxical term reproductive rights to justify the hedonistic destruction of innocent human life where there is no reproduction and there are no rights of the baby who is killed without due process of law. In many ways, our work in Massachusetts will become even more difficult. The rage brought forth by the culture of death has targeted many, including volunteer organizations that seek to help women with problem pregnancies. As described last time in my interview with Kelly Wilcox, the director of Clearway Clinics of Worcester and Springfield, pregnancy resource centers are under attack in Massachusetts, not only by vandals, but by state and federal legislators and by city councilors who are targeting pregnancy resource centers in an attempt to shut them down. This underscores the hypocrisy that despite the assertion that abortion clinics purport to help women, their supporters are making attempts to destroy agencies that truly exist in a financially free and altruistic way to help women without cost, while the Planned Parenthoods of the world make a profit in blood money. Today I will play part three of my interview with Andrew Beckwith as we segue from our discussion of relegating abortion to the ash heap of history to physician-assisted suicide, which deserves to be in the same ash heap. Before we continue, let us pray. For as stated by the U.S. Catholic bishops, only with prayer. Prayer that storms the heavens for justice and mercy. Prayer that cleanses our hearts and souls. Will the culture of death that surrounds us today be replaced with a culture of life? Moloch was an ancient god worshipped by the people neighboring Israel during Old Testament times, and whose worship involved ritual child sacrifice, and which God's chosen people were forbidden to do. Leviticus chapter 20 verses 4 and 5 reads this way, If the people of the land condone the giving of offspring to Moloch, By failing to put the wrongdoer to death, I myself will turn against that individual and his or her family, and I will cut off from their people both the wrongdoer and all who follow this person by prostituting themselves with Moloch. O God, child sacrifice continues in our culture as our young are sacrificed on the altar of choice, and even celebrated by some as a declaration of personal independence, a declaration of autonomy. This is my body, they say. Lord, help us to understand 
that the statement, this is my body, should make us reflect upon self-sacrifice and not child sacrifice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before going to part three of my conversation with Andrew Beckwith, let us again reflect on the victory for the United States Constitution, for the American people, and for God's people. Last time we reflected on some inspirational excerpts from the summary statement of the Supreme Court of the United States Dobbs decision, authored by Justice Samuel Alito. Today I would like to reflect upon portions of the concurring opinion from Justice Clarence Thomas, who in my opinion speaks to an even more fundamental issue than the erroneous finding of a right to an abortion in the United States Constitution. The concurring opinion of Justice Thomas begins this way. I join the opinion of the court because it correctly holds that there is no constitutional right to abortion. Respondents invoke one source for that right. The 14th Amendment's guarantee that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The court well explains why, under our substantive due process precedence, the purported right to an abortion is not a form of liberty protected by the due process clause. Such a right is neither deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, nor implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. This was argued in the case Washington v. Glucksburg, which we will discuss shortly in part three of my interview with Andrew Beckwith. That case, Washington v. Glucksburg, in 1997 found that there is no constitutional right to physician-assisted suicide. Justice Thomas continues, The idea that the framers of the 14th Amendment understood the Due Process Clause to protect a right to an abortion is farcical. Justice Thomas continues, I write separately to emphasize a second, more fundamental reason why there is no abortion guarantee lurking in the Due Process Clause. Considerable historical evidence indicates that so-called due process of law, merely required executive and judicial actors to comply with legislative enactments and the common law when depriving a person of life, liberty, or property. Other sources, by contrast, suggest that due process of law prohibited legislatures from authorizing the deprivation of a person's life, liberty, or property without providing him the customary procedures to which free men were entitled by the old law of England. Either way, the Due Process Clause at most guarantees process. It does not, as the court's substantive due process cases suppose, forbid the government to infringe on certain fundamental liberty interests at all, no matter what process is provided. Continues Justice Thomas, As I have previously explained, so-called substantive due process is an oxymoron that lacks any basis in the Constitution. The notion that a constitutional provision that guarantees only process before a person is deprived of life, liberty, or property could define the substance of those rights strains credulity for even the most casual users of words. The resolution of this case is thus straightforward because the Due Process Clause does not secure any substantive rights. It does not secure a right 
to an abortion. Justice Thomas goes on to write cases like Griswold v. Connecticut, which, in 1965, found the right of married persons to obtain contraceptives, Lawrence v. Texas, which, in 2003, found the right to engage in private consensual sexual acts, and Obergefell v. Hodges, which, in 2015, found a right to same-sex marriage, are not at issue in this case. The court's abortion cases are unique, and no party has asked us to decide whether our entire 14th Amendment jurisprudence must be preserved or revised. For that reason, he states, in future cases we should reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell, because any substantive due process decision is demonstrably erroneous. We have the duty, states Justice Thomas, to correct the error established in those precedents. In practice, the court's approach for identifying so-called fundamental rights unquestionably involves policy-making rather than neutral legal analysis. Nowhere is this exaltation of judicial policy-making clearer than this court's abortion jurisprudence. In Roe v. Wade, the court divined a right to an abortion because it felt that the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty included a right to privacy that is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. In Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the court likewise identified an abortion guarantee in the liberty protected by the 14th Amendment, but rather than a right to privacy, it invoked an ethereal right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Continues Clarence Thomas, the right to an abortion is ultimately a policy goal in desperate search of a constitutional justification. Substantive due process distorts other areas of constitutional law. For example, once this court identifies a fundamental right for one class of individuals, it invokes the Equal Protection Clause to demand exacting scrutiny of statutes that deny the right to others. Therefore, regardless of the doctrinal context, the court often demands extra justification for encroachments on preferred rights while relaxing purportedly higher standards of review for less preferred rights. Substantive due process is the core inspiration for many of the court's constitutionally unmoored policy judgments. Substantive due process is often wielded to disastrous ends. For instance, in Dred Scott v. Sanford, the court invoked a species of substantive due process to announce that Congress was powerless to emancipate slaves brought into the federal territories. While Dred Scott was overruled on the battlefield of the Civil War and by constitutional amendment, that overruling was purchased at the price of immeasurable human suffering. Justice Thomas' concurring opinion on Dobbs continues, Now the court rightly overrules Roe and Casey, two of the court's most notoriously incorrect substantive due process decisions. After... More than 63 million abortions have been performed. The harm caused by this court's forays into substantive due process remains immeasurable. Because the court properly applies our substantive due process precedents to reject the fabrication of constitutional right to an abortion, and because the Dobbs case does not present the opportunity to reject substantive due process entirely, I join the court's opinion. But, in future cases, states Justice Thomas, we should follow the text of the Constitution 
which sets forth certain substantive rights that cannot be taken away and adds, beyond that, a right to due process when life, liberty, or property is taken away. Concludes Clarence Thomas, substantive due process conflicts with that textual command and has harmed our country in many ways. Accordingly, we should eliminate it from our jurisprudence at the earliest opportunity. Now please allow me to summarize my own understanding of this simple and insightful opinion. Due process of law protects people's enumerated rights in the Constitution, such as life and liberty. So-called substantive due process seeks to find rights in the Constitution that are not specifically mentioned. The 14th Amendment in its due process and equal protection clauses should not be the hiding place for fabricated rights that are really the court's policy preferences. This process began with Griswold, which found a right to privacy so that married couples could obtain contraception. The Eisenstadt case, under the Equal Protection Clause, extended this supposed right to contraception to unmarried people. Sterile contraceptive sex laid the groundwork for finding a right to sodomy in the Lawrence case in Texas, and once sterile homosexual sex was legitimized by the Supreme Court of the United States, it was only a matter of time before the court invoked the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to legalize so-called same-sex marriage across the country at a time when 35 states had already made same-sex marriage illegal. So just as Thomas is saying that just as Roe was farcical because it found a right to an abortion, Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell are also farcical, and these cases should be revisited under the same reasoning, namely that such rights had never existed in our country's laws and traditions. Such issues are the domain of the legislature, not the courts. As brilliant as Justice Alito's opinion is, it is the Thomas concurring opinion that really drives the left crazy. His reasoning would remove the so-called right to have sex with whomever and whenever one wanted it and without consequences. The sexual revolution of the 60s has, in fact, brought on this and many other disastrous consequences. And now here is part three of my conversation with Andrew Beckwith. As we transition from the right to life in the beginning of life to the right to life at the end of life, we resume our conversation discussing the aforementioned Glucksburg decision in 1997 regarding assisted suicide and how that decision help euthanize Roe v. Wade. MFI has been fighting a lot of battles, and one of them is a physician-assisted suicide. And um, kind of an interesting segue, I think, from talking about um, Roe v. Wade being overturned to physician-assisted suicide is there was an article that came out in National Review by Wesley J. Smith, who was a longtime uh, opponent to physician-assisted suicide. He talked in the article, he used the words uh, of a delicious irony that assisted suicide euthanized Roe v. Wade. And it was a very, it was a very clever uh, article because um, uh, Roe v. Wade used the, the Glucksburg versus Washington case in the early 90s. That case was brought to the Supreme Court saying that there should be a right to assisted suicide, and they were trying to do that in the same way they pushed through Roe v. Wade. You know, they were trying to say, just like there's a constitutional right to abortion, there should be a constitutional right to assisted suicide. Unfortunately, 
the Supreme Court back in the early 90s took that Glucksburg decision and tossed it firmly out the window and it, it defeated it nine to nothing. And that was a precedent that was used in the Dobbs case. They used that precedent to say it was not in our uh, tradition and in our laws for assisted suicide. Yeah. So you can't use that. And the last line of his um, of that article, uh, Wesley J. Smith said, uh, in a hubristic attempt to force assisted suicide on the nation in the same way abortion had been, euthanasia activists instead laid the groundwork for Roe's obliteration. The irony is so delicious, he said, I can't stop smiling. So I thought that was a tremendous... Did you, did you uh, happen to come across that? I, I, mean, I saw the headline. I haven't had a chance to read through the whole article, but I, I understand what he's saying. And mm-hmm. uh, I mean, really, the two, the two movements, abortion-assisted suicide... I mean, they're just the opposite ends of the same candle. I yeah. Mean, Matt McClive talks about protecting life, innocent life, conception, and natural death. Mm-hmm. And I think both of them ultimately rely on this false philosophy that there's a quality of life below which the life is not worth protecting. Certainly that is the, that is the ideology that is spoken openly mm-hmm. uh, for assisted suicide, you know, type of quality of life. And with abortion... You know, I think earlier on, uh, part of the arguments were every child needs to be a wanted child. And just think of the lives that these children would have and, yes. you know, yeah. if they were born, that they'd be in poverty and perhaps abuse. Mm-hmm. So it's a similar type of, as if the mother is, is doing it to the child a favor by making sure they were never born. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so just a, a similar mentality that there's some sort of, obviously, the arbitrary <laughs> threshold of quality of life defined mm-hmm. by somebody mm-hmm. um, probably changing right on a regular basis below which life is not worth protecting and so i think you know thank goodness the court in glucksburg refused to pull a second rabbit out of their hat yes and yeah. then you know that that did create a, a uh, jurisprudential inconsistency which mm. has been somewhat rectified now yeah yeah, it's um, fortunately, I think they probably saw the error of their ways in Roe v. Wade, and they weren't going to make yeah. the same mistake twice. So getting t- specifically to physician-assisted suicide, um, can you mention where that stands now in Massachusetts and how uh, MFI, Mass Family Institute, is uh, addressing it? Sure. I mean, as, as you well know, for the last decade, it's my initial participation in this fight was in 2012 when I first joined MFI and you had mm. uh, the statewide ballot initiative trying mm-hmm. to pass a law on, you know, on the ballot um, that would legalize assisted suicide. And that was really close, but we were able to win about 51 to 49. Right. And since that time, it, is, it has not gotten back on the ballot. They've been pushing um, in the legislature to pass a law. Um, and that keeps kind of getting stuck in committee that I have hearings. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember one of the first hearings I went to, there was a man who testified against, against assisted suicide. Because part, one of the aspects of it is, well, if you're diagnosed with six months or less to live, then you can go ahead and, and take your life with mm-hmm. uh, prescription medication. Which, again, that's okay. If you only have six, uh, six months or less to live, sort of your quality of life is obviously low enough that just... You know, ended early under your own power. Mm-hmm. But there was a guy who testified that he'd been diagnosed with six months or less to live 27 years ago. Yes, right. Um, yeah, that's a big problem. And interestingly, so they've never, they haven't gotten anywhere with the legislation, praise God. Mm-hmm. And the other tactic they're using is in the courts. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a doctor who had, I think, I think it was cancer, and right. sued for the right... Is it Kliegler? Yeah, Kliegler. Yeah. yeah. Sued, sued for the right to commit assisted suicide. Um, you know, still pending in the courts. I think he lost an appeal, so it's working its way through the system. But in his initial filings, he talked about how he's got this, I think it was incurable cancer, only has a certain amount of time to live. And then in the interim, there was this great news article, it might have been in the Globe, that he had a relapse, or sorry, remission, remission, mm-hmm. and he's off like walking his dog on the beach and saving yeah. turtles and the weapons <laughs> yeah. and doing all this great stuff, which yeah. isn't great for his legal case. 
That's it kind true. of proves the point. Yeah, that's Had true. the court said, yep, go ahead, you know, literally knock yourself out, you wouldn't have that glowing globe article a couple of years later when he's in remission and, and doing great things. Yeah. And actually, he's he's been fighting this um, for the right to kill himself for yeah. I, probably about five years or so. A lot yeah. longer than six months. Yeah. Yeah, a lot longer than six months. Yeah. So um, since we're on the topic, I guess uh, the, the latest thing is that um, it looks like, please God, that it's going to fail again this year in Massachusetts, yeah, that the bill is still kind of languishing. Uh, it did pass out of the Public Health Committee, and I think it may have also technically passed out of the next committee, which, which was the yeah. Health Finance Committee. Uh, but it still hasn't come to the s- Senate floor, and it hasn't come to the House floor. It's late. It's very late in the game, and if we can hold yeah. this off for another month or so, um, barring some sneaky lame duck uh, session like right. they did with the Typically Roe Act. Typically July 31st is <laughs> when the clock runs out. No right. legislation hasn't been passed yet. turns back into a pumpkin. But mm-hmm. last session, they, you know, because of COVID, yes. uh, fill in the blank, whatever you want to do, uh, yep. they extended the session until the end of the calendar year. So you had, you know, that's when they passed the, the Infanticide Act. After everyone had just been reelected, they passed it, and then they get the yep. years to make the voters forget about it. Yep. And they run again. Hopefully they won't do that again this year. Yeah, well, they, they, they better not, but uh, I don't put anything past this uh, Massachusetts right. legislature. This concludes Part 3 of my conversation with Andrew Beckwith. Tune in next time for Part 4 of the interview when we will discuss other cultural issues which place Massachusetts families at risk and how Massachusetts Family Institute is defending parental rights. And until next time, remember, we should always treat life with care and respect. And at the very least, we should first do no harm. First, do no harm with Dr. Mark Rollo is produced at WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Richburg. We are very happy to share it with other networks. Thank you for tuning in to First Do No Harm. Dr. Rollo welcomes your questions and comments. You may contact him at markrollo978 at gmail.com. That's M-A-R-K-R-O-L-L-O 978 at gmail.com. Thank you, and until next week, remember, first, do no harm.